early implantation makes difference on those later language outcomes and what we can do now is immerse them in sound really early. Welcome to this episode of Hearing Health Today. I'm your host, Craig Sharp. In this episode, A Pediatric Perspective, we'll hear from Alicia Davis, a certified listening and spoken language specialist, practicing speech pathologist, and the general manager of clinical programs at the Shepherd Center in Sydney, Australia. She'll share her experiences and discuss the evidence for early intervention in children with hearing loss. On the other side of the story, we'll speak with Jen, a parent of two children with hearing loss, who will share her family's journey. This is a podcast for hearing health professionals. If you are a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. We're excited to be joined by Alicia and Jen here on Hearing Health Today. So before we get started, I might just turn it over to each of you to give a brief introduction of who you are and uh, how you came into the hearing health community. Alicia? Thanks, Craig. Lovely to be with you and chatting today. I've been in the hearing healthcare community for nearly 18 years now. Um, I started at the Shepherd Centre and I'm still here. So that says (laughs) something about how much I love working in it and with the families. Um, I spent a long time at university trying to work out what I wanted to do and eventually stumbled on speech pathology and stumbled then on oral habilitation. And I just love the model of teaching families and what the possibilities were for children with hearing loss. So I landed my dream job when I finished and I've been here ever since. And now I look after the clinical team at the Shepherd Centre. So we're based in New South Wales and ACT in Australia. And we have an early intervention and cochlear implant program. Fantastic. And uh, Alicia, where are you speaking to us from today? So I am speaking to you from sunny Sydney. Um, So always take this opportunity just to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm calling in from. So that is the Gadigal people today of the Eora Nation. So just paying my respects to elders past, present and future. I'm actually back in the clinic, which is lovely to see families and the team a little bit more in person given the pandemic and to seeing people in real life, as my children would say. Fantastic. Jen, could you provide a bit of a background about how you entered the hearing health community for our listeners? Yes, I can. So hi, Craig, and hi, everyone. I am a mum of two beautiful girls who both have hearing loss. So Amelia, my eldest, who is now 10, was born with a moderate to severe hearing loss. And Olivia, my little six-year-old, was born with a profound hearing loss. Pretty much from the get-go, after I left hospital with 20 booklets or textbooks I should say um, I ended up finding the Shepherd Centre and they've been my second family helping with all my problems with the kids and fears happiness so that's me in a nutshell Um, I'm calling from I'm here from Sydney and I'm at home at the moment waiting to pick the kids up after our meeting today Fantastic. And I have to ask, was Alicia one of the speech pathologists that you encountered at the Shepherd Centre? Yes, she was. It was just when Amelia was starting to go through the cochlear path that I was introduced to Alicia. Fantastic. Well, I wanted to kick off this podcast by asking you, Alicia, just as a foundation, why is it so important for children with hearing loss to receive early intervention? When I started working in the field, children were coming in much older. They weren't being diagnosed early. They were coming in and we were seeing them at two, three years of age. And it was really clear that they weren't speaking, that their language was really delayed. And then we'd start the cochlear implant process at that age. It was amazing then to get them up to two, three word sentences by the time they went to school. We thought that was really good. But with the incredible advances in technology with universal newborn hearing screening, I think that's just been a universal game changer. So seeing Seeing children being diagnosed so early, fitted so early with hearing aids, and I think it's that fitting of hearing aids that then leads on to the cochlear implantation. And we're working with very young children and we're working them with them from the earliest of days. So we're familiar with them and we know what their responses are. So it's nearly like we're no longer waiting for the evidence for an individual child to show us that they need an implant um, because we're seeing they're not responding to sounds in those early days. We know from their sucking responses and their stealing responses, we know from their, you know, vocalisations that they're just not getting the access they need. And I think the evidence that exists that has been watertight in terms of providing confidence for us, it shows us really clearly now that waiting makes a difference 
early implantation makes a difference on those later language outcomes. And what we can do now is immerse them in sound really early and they can get those repetitions and they can hear what they need to develop speech. Yeah. These little people have no concept of language and they're learning it as they go. And Jen, so I guess from the parents' perspective, what was this like, especially with your eldest daughter, when you're going through this for the very first time? How did you first discover that your daughter might have hearing loss? And how did you connect with healthcare professionals that helped you navigate through that? We found out she had a hearing loss through the newborn hearing test in the mm -hmm. hospital. So I think she was about three days old when they did the swish test. And I was completely... It didn't phase me at all. The nurse came in and said, oh, can I do the hearing test? I said, yep, that's fine. I was sitting on the bed, putting makeup on, getting ready for visitors to come. And, mm -hmm. and then she failed that one. Didn't think too much of it. They said, oh, yes, um, it's quite normal for C-section babies to fail the swish test. And I guess I was still in that, you know, I just had the baby and I, in my little dream world at that stage which I didn't even click I, was, I didn't have a c-section so I don't even I, I just accepted that mm. and I went with it a few days later we went we were at home and we got the drill out and she was fast asleep and she didn't bat an eyelid she was and she was quite close to all the noise and that's when I reality here I thought oh there's something there's something that must be wrong I'm so we went for the second swish test. She failed that as well. And then we went straight in for the ABR, the auditory brain stem response test. Quite, I found that very difficult, um, just keeping her asleep. It has to be done while she's asleep and it's a very long test. And that's when it was confirmed that she had a moderate to severe hearing loss. And how old was she at that point? She would have been a couple of weeks old. I left that room, the hospital, with probably about seven textbook-like books um, with all of the information, and that was it. So they kind of handed me the baby, said, yep, here's your baby, she's got a hearing loss, and here's all the work that you need to do to work out how you want her to live her life in the future. And that, kind of <laughs> that was a real shock. That was, I felt like there was no support initially. Yeah, what did you do from there? Like, how did I, I spiralled into a terrible depressive state I couldn't deal with anything for quite a while mm -hmm. my ex-partner at the time he was working nearby the shepherd center and we went in there one Saturday morning and as soon as we walked in we were so welcomed by everyone um, it just so happened that there was this 16 year old girl there at the time with cochlear implants and the speech that this girl had was just absolutely phenomenal. I, I was in awe. I actually started crying when I heard her speaking. And we pretty much signed up for the Shepherd Centre straight away. As soon as we walked in, we felt at home. Jen, so how much time elapsed between when you got that orange book to when you walked into the Shepherd Centre? Was that just a couple of years? No, or... no, we wanted to get things done as soon as possible. Um, it was probably a week tops. They were really keen to get us started with therapy sessions, everything pretty much as soon as we were able to do it. And that's when our journey began of sessions, you know, every week at the Shepherd Centre and going to Australian Hearing a few times a week because she was fitted with hearing aids at first. Jen, can I ask, was it difficult to work in, walk in that first time? Yes. Yes, it was. I, I was in denial. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, you know, I was holding my perfect little baby yeah. and she... Couldn't hear a word that anything. She couldn't hear the birds. She couldn't hear me tell her how much I love her. She couldn't. Mm. It was one of the hardest things I had to do because mm. it was actually acknowledging the fact that my child has a disability. She's got a hearing loss. Alicia, how typical is Jen's story where someone might get information from the hospital after hearing a newborn screening test, but then mm. kind of left to their own devices to figure out what the next step is in the pathway. Very typical. So I think I'd probably say that each individual circumstance is different. So it's hard to say a blanket approach, but most often children with hearing loss are born into a family of hearing parents. So it's not something that they've experienced before. So navigating that pathway is a whole bunch of new information and they're expecting one thing and suddenly very, very early on, they're on a very different path and trajectory than what they expected to be. And we hear a lot, very similar to Jen's story, that 
I didn't want to be at the Shepherd's End. That wasn't where we were supposed to go and how do we know what's right? And you're trying to navigate mother's groups and sleeping and eating and all of those really fundamental, really important things. Mm-hmm. There's this massive layer on top of that that I think is really worthwhile acknowledging. We've really invested heavily in a child and family counselling team here, um, acknowledging that we used to just be speech pathologists and therapists and it's all about getting them talking, but you've so seen that it's not that at all. It's actually meeting families where they're at and helping them take that first step to where they want to go. You guys have such a great reputation at the Shepherd Center of early intervention and getting great outcomes with the children that you work with. And I'm curious, how do you sort of reach out or how do you get in contact with those parents who might have just got this news that they're not quite sure how to, to manage? And maybe they don't show up at the Shepherd Centre as quickly as, as Jen and her family mm. did. And I think that there's no perfect system. Um, but definitely to get into those intervention services, it's, it's an opt-in for families. It's definitely not an opt-out model. Okay? I think what we care about is making sure that families are in a integrated service. Um, so there's other services like us, RADBC mm-hmm. and others, and all around the world there are places. But it's making sure the families know it to get into it and also know the impact of hearing loss. So we see children with unilateral and mild hearing loss as well as all of the levels. And often the children with profound and severe hearing loss levels are seeking out quicker because obviously they Mm -hmm. need a communication mode and they're making a quick choice. But often we see children with um, less significant levels of hearing loss coming in later or Mm -hmm. not really realising the impact of needing to do it to give children the best opportunity. You mentioned earlier, Alicia, how important it is to do early intervention. Mm. Is that true along the whole spectrum of hearing loss? So if you have a newborn that has moderate hearing loss, is it as important to intervene early as for a, a child who has profound hearing loss? That's a resounding yes, absolutely. But I think different levels. So a child with moderate hearing loss may not need the same intensity. It may not need the same length. But I think helping parents, and what I really care about is giving parents the information so they can do the best job because they are with their children 24-7. So it's not about coming in and seeing someone. It's about giving them some strategies they can incorporate into their everyday life. And I think, Jen, I probably said this to you a million times in sessions. It's not rocket science. It seems really the stuff I'm telling you is just really point to the doorbell. Let's play this game. They think they see us playing. It's like, well, it's playing, but we're doing certain playing. And that's, I think, give parents the strategies, no matter the level of hearing loss, because it's going to have an impact. They are going to have reduced access to sound. And so it's getting them fitted and making sure parents know how to maximise that. And I think even more now, we're seeing impacts in literacy, in social skills, executive function, that type of thing, much bigger than we now know how to teach a child to say full sentences and communicate beautifully but it's using that in different environments and hearing and noise at school and all of those type of things that I think it's absolutely key to be working on early. So Jen you've now connected with the Shepherd Centre you're with your eldest daughter and working through some of the different treatment pathways that are available through the Shepherd Centre. I'm just curious what's going on in your mind now that you've connected with a center that can help you navigate through that. Is it still overwhelming? Did you feel a little bit more confident in terms of what the future might look like? Definitely. After I met that teenager and I saw everything that she had achieved, going to mainstream schooling and her speech, that was the one thing that really got me. Mm -hmm. I had a chat to her and she was just doing everyday activities that any other typical 16-year-old girl was doing, if not more. I mean, she was telling me she was going to go skydiving and I thought, oh my goodness, this girl with found hearing loss. I thought they'd have to go to special school. And it was a complete opposite to what I had imagined. Did your daughter wear hearing aids for a period of time before deciding to get a cochlear implant? What what did that look like? So she had her hearing aids and then she had her one cochlear implant at 11 and a half months and the second at one and a half years old. Was that a difficult choice to make? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Like how did you approach that decision and ultimately... Um, decide to go forward what what did that mean for you and your family my child having to wear a hearing aid in my eyes back then was the worst thing for me I I guess it was the denial of her hearing loss and I was going through that mourning process of my child being deaf and then the idea of her wearing a cochlear implant when it stuck to her head and I just I didn't want my little girl to be different but after seeing other children at the Shepherd Centre with cochlear implants and see how they were absolutely thriving in their speech. Just the cutest little voices. They just sounded like any other little child. And they were thriving, meeting all their milestones and having conversations with myself, their little friends. So that kind of made it a bit easier. But when I actually found out that, yes, that's 
the path that it's looking like we're going to have to go down, I kind of went into panic mode again. Um, Alicia did help ease my nerves quite a lot. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it was what was in the best interest for my daughter. Jen, I was going to say, you, you mentioned uh, milestones. Just pivoting the conversation back to you, Alicia, how do you help parents understand what those milestones are? So it's really interesting listening to Jen talk because my perspective in in working with um, children is that we want to make it make sure it's the right decision too. Hey, so it's having that information and knowing are those mm-hmm. milestones being be- met and how sure are we in those early phases? And Jen, I think with Amelia, she her hearing loss was in the severe level by the time we were looking at this, but she still had access to a little bit of sound. And I think when it's profound, Craig, it's much clearer because it's like okay, if the family wants spoken language, yeah. then this is what we do. When there's that little bit of residual hearing, it does yeah. it. It, it makes it more tricky and um, I think that's the hardest and in terms of tracking those milestones what we're doing is looking at vocalization so we're looking at the range of um, speech sounds that they're making we're looking at how often they're making them are they making different types of them are they making by labial place manner all of the different types of things and then are they coming out with what they're hearing so um, colleagues in the field um, Carol Flex and Jay Medell they always talk about what goes in comes out and I firmly believe it's the signal that you get that comes out and I remember with Amelia Jen was it milk and she just could not say it clearly it was like "Mm," oh I can't remember exactly what it was but it was we just couldn't get it clear and she just wasn't getting access to those sounds even close even from a distance with visual cues was better but couldn't get it no matter how much practice we did but because of that residual hearing it did take us long, mm-hmm. longer, but those um, those really key milestones of the speech, and then in terms of tracking their listening progress as well. So, are they actually not just hearing a sound and detecting it, but what are they actually doing it with it? So, the, tapping into that brain component of listening, um, and we could see that Amelia was detecting some sounds but definitely not all that she needed and definitely not using it to develop speech and language from those stages so even for me it was a gosh I really need to be sure here in working with Jen and giving her the information I remember standing on a street corner and calling you Jen to say there's a surgery spot are we going to do this are we going to do this it's your decision do you remember yeah I remember (laughs) I remember standing in the kitchen Walk it in. That's fine. I trust you and your decision. I know that it's the right move. Yeah, and I think as a professional, you take that responsibility on board and it's your little person and we get to see all the time the benefits of it. So we do have that security and I do see normal speech and language, so I understand it, but it doesn't lighten the decision for each family at the end of the day. And is there a standardized tool or framework that you can use to to help guide that decision yes and no is probably the answer so there's not one magic tool that does it all that you you know put it all in and it ticks out to say okay this child needs a cochlear implant also as well you can have two hearing losses on paper that look exactly the same but functionally are so very different in terms of how a child is actually performing with that level of hearing loss um so there's Mm -hmm. there's language tests but they don't get to be they don't give us good information on what a child's really doing till like four or five years of age right And there's good detection tests so we can know that what infants are hearing very early, which sounds they're responding to, high, middle, low frequencies, and even speech sounds with corticals. But tracking their listening, I think, has been really key. And here at the Shepherd Centre, I think that's something that we've really needed. And so what we use is the functional listening index um, that we've used to track a child's listening progress over time. And what that does is we found that it predicts what their later language is going to be. So in looking at their listening skills and how they develop, we wanted to track it from birth to six years of age. And like height charts or weight charts or growth charts you get when you have a child and you're tracking their progress in line with developmental norms, it's the same. So we can actually visually and we can provide parents a track to say, okay, well, this is where they're going. So if their trajectory is looking lower than what we'd expect, that's useful for us as professionals, but also for families to guide and make those decisions that is so critical and key to do early because we also know that making a decision not to do anything is a decision in itself right yeah and is the functional listening index based off largely like milestones like developmental milestones or how do you track progress against that index there's a bunch of great checklists and listening tools out there the gap for us was that there wasn't one that tracked a child over time sure so we could say okay yes there's a milestone at one they should be doing this so we Uh know at two a child should have a two-item auditory memory 
And what we were finding was you jot that down in progress notes, but you'd have to like trawl through progress notes to, to put together a picture of a child's progress, if that makes sense. So there was nothing that mm -hmm. um, looked at it over time that could visually provide it. So it's a checklist of basically 64 pieces of um, listening milestones that we'd expect that it, that moves on from just the detection sounds but also includes all that brain listening comprehension pieces to make sure a child is making progress. So I'm imagining there might be an audiologist somewhere in the world listening to this podcast uh -huh. thinking, ah, oh, I really would like to use that <laughs> functional listening index. Is that something that's available for other professionals to use? Yeah, absolutely. So the journey with the listening index has been really interesting, Craig. We started seeing lots of power in the data and lots of patterns of information, how useful it was. Um, other clinics started using it. So it's really grown organically and out of need. We've got a hard copy of the form that's available okay. on the Shepherd Centre website. So you can jump on and download that. Okay, fantastic. We'll put a link to that in the podcast for, for okay. folks who are interested. Um, so Jen, is, are you familiar with the functional listening index? Is that something that you used or um, Alicia or others counseled you on for, for either or both of your daughters? Yes, we to use them for both of the girls. I have more memory of using it with Olivia. It was really nice for her therapist at the time if I had any concerns, which to be honest with you, I didn't have many concerns when it came mm -hmm. to Olivia's speech, but she would be able to physically show me where she was at at that point in time yeah i think and i could see where what she could be achieving next and um it's a great tool to have when you had your youngest daughter what was that journey like how was that different or the same from your experience with amelia during the pregnancy i was actually hoping in a way that she would have a hearing loss some people might think that that's absolutely insane but it was i don't have a hearing loss nor does their dad or anyone in the family. So I just thought it would be really nice for them, for Amelia to have someone to be able to relate to in that part of her life. And at that point, I realised as well that hearing loss, it's not a big deal. You wouldn't even know that they've got a disability. They're just like any other child. So for Amelia, it took me a good three years or so to get over uh, her mm -hmm. hearing loss, to accept it, um, to grieve it, to to come to terms with it. But with Olivia, I was prepared for it. And when I left, I said, I'm actually glad that it's a profound hearing loss because our decision's made. We don't need to worry about how she's going to do with her hearing aids. And it was just straight to cochlear. The second time she ever used had her um, cochlear implant switched on, and she had just woken up and she was propped up on Amelia's bed and we were recording it and we turned it on and she was like this lifeless little dolly. And as soon as we turned it on, her, she lifted her head up and she just kind of propped right up against the bed and she was just looking at us and moving her head and I was just like, wow, she's, she can hear. Like it was such an obvious response. She went from, like I said, a lifeless little dolly with her head hanging low and she just lifted herself right up and started looking. And yeah, it's an absolutely incredible response. So Jen, if you were to give advice to the hearing health professionals or the community, I guess, at large around the world who help counsel and guide other parents through this journey, having been through this twice, what would your advice be? How, how could this pathway be made a little bit easier for, for parents like you to help understand um, what, what's the timeline for decision-making on, on what these different interventions are and, and how do you sort of navigate and get to the right center and, and really understand um, you know, what trade-offs you're making by intervening early versus intervening a little bit later? Well, I guess the earlier you intervene, the better access to sound that your child's going to have. Um, with finding a centre, you'd go to somewhere that makes you feel comfortable, uh, somewhere that makes you feel welcomed and at home because at the end of the day, they will become your second family. And just to not be afraid because I know it is scary at first, but they will come through this just hearing them speak and hearing them actually tell you that they love you for the first time. And it's beautiful seeing them, being able to hear you tell them how much you love them. And what's your daughter's relationship with their uh, hearing health providers? They used to love going to the Shepherd Centre. Love it. 
So they're both at school now, so they don't go anymore. But with Alicia, Amelia had <laughs> such fun with her. She's always been into craft and it was always, she'd leave there with paint all over her face, literally. I made friends there, parents going through the same thing as I was, which made things a lot easier because you kind of feel like you're in a bubble until you meet other parents going through it and you realise you're not alone and it's a great thing that the Shepherd Centre do provide. Um, that makes me smile, Jan, as a therapist. You know, I think for adults as well, Craig, you've got to have fun. We're working with families for a long time and yes, the child needs to enjoy it, but I am a real believer that the adults need to have fun and enjoy it as well. And if we're not, then it just becomes weekly drag. And that's where that family and professional partnership really comes through. And it's different for each professional and each family. But Jen, I remember the birthday parties. I remember the book reading and all that stuff, but it's fun. And that's what gives us purpose in doing it. And it never gets old hearing your story, Jen, and saying and understanding how meaningful that is. Is that common? So you, you talk about an approach, Alicia, to care that, that is fun and interactive. Yeah, so I imagine I imagine there's differences all over. Um, Craig, I think, um, so this is that we use a listening and spoken language approach. Um, so very much on the principles of auditory verbal therapy that you guide and coach parents in a number of different ways. So taking that step back of it's not us performing the activity all the time, but it's actually involving the parents and not just involving them, but getting them to do it because they're the ones that are going to be doing it at home, right? But I think you have to be very transparent with families that we're not just playing games here because I think that's a danger as well, Jen. I don't know if you ever thought that, but oh my gosh, we're just going and playing games and actually not doing anything here. So that's the challenge, I think, professionally, is actually um, helping families understand why I'm going to do this and we're going to do this and then you're going to do it and then how are we going to do that at home and can we see the difference in that? So measuring that outcomes and how that then relates to the family's goal, which is for their child to talk or to say yes or whatever it would be. One thing I'm struck about um, when I hear you describe this approach to therapy, Alicia, is that there's a lot of different stakeholders involved. So you've uh-huh. got the family, you've got the school, you've got the surgeon, the audiologist, the therapist or the rehabilitationist. How do you manage all of those different stakeholders and, and create sort of this multidisciplinary team? What are some of the challenges in doing that? Yeah, it's it's challenge, hey? Like I think one <laughs> professional, one family, then that family goes to another professional and sees a surgeon and then the family goes to one audiologist. That might seem easier, right? Um, mm. But I think that then places more onus on the family. It's our job as professionals to be able to integrate our care so that we can work together so we're not putting that extra load on families and mm-hmm. um, making it seamless. I think we love to talk as therapists and audiologists, mm collaborating is easy but it, it's um it takes time and it's challenging to make sure we're always on the same page and make sure that we're saying the same things and make sure that the family is at the center of that all the time yeah. so that they're the holder of their information i have a very different lens yeah. to the child and family counselor who might be hearing and seeing very different things from a family and i've really learned that over time you know i'm looking at it this way but they're looking at that and if they're saying the family are raising flags about implantation and they're worried about this then we have to listen to that and i don't think it's it's right to just have one input into that it the outcome is takes more coordination but where you get to is you know far beyond the outcomes if we all doing it individually so practically what does that look like do you guys have mm. um, case review meetings with the different professionals that are that are treating a patient or how do you I guess manage that flow of communication so we have a team that surrounds the family so there's a case manager all yep. the time then there's a team with all the different disciplines um, we mm-hmm. have clinical team meetings every week where there's different flags for different mm-hmm. reasons if a child's coming up for cochlear implantation or if there's a different hearing test that we would discuss it we have a database system where everyone can be up to date we um, things so if a hearing test has come back in then all of the team know about it straight away rather than relying on the audiologist to manually tell each member of the team sure so that when a family walks in they don't have to describe that five times yeah. I think it's the systems are key luckily we've had um, a CEO on a board that are happy to invest in systems but I think that's been a real learning for me is when we, we were seeing 100 kids maybe 15 years ago and now we're seeing 700 mm-hmm. um, to go with that growth has been a huge investment in the system so that we can do it without the manual effort. Otherwise, we just wouldn't be able to to grow and to do what we do. Yeah. And Jen, what was that like from, a, I guess, a parent's perspective? Did you feel like your case manager or uh, one particular professional was the coordinator of care for your kids? Or how, how did you, I guess, manage those different touch points as a, as a parent? 
we did have a few therapists. Mm -hmm. Everyone worked seamlessly. Like everyone, they were all on the same page. Mm. I'm the kind of person I get, I, I'm a creature of habit mm -hmm. and I did get used to therapists. And then when we changed, I did feel it, the girls as well. But I guess that's a good thing to have that change in place. So then once they actually do start school and they stop seeing that therapist every week, mm -hmm. um, it wouldn't be such a big deal to them. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about that off to school transition, because I know that um, that's something that can be a struggle both from a professional perspective as well as from a personal or, or a patient perspective. Um, so making that transition to school, different environment, um, parents and kids are worried about being perceived as different. Plus, there's, I would imagine, um, some things that the, the teacher might need to be aware of uh, to help create a learning environment that's most uh, effective for children with, with hearing loss and cochlear implants. So um, maybe ask the question first to you, Alicia, how does the professional community or you at the Shepherd Center approach that transition and make sure that everyone has all the right information to help make that the most successful transition as possible? I think my first answer is early. Mm. We used to maybe wait for the last six months before school. But it's too late yeah. and I think it's talking about that early and it starts from three and even, you know, getting families thinking about it rather than waiting for that, oh my gosh, my child's going to school next year because that's another yeah. transition, right? I think involving early education settings, so where the child's at preschool or childcare is key. Mm -hmm. I think what we're really seeing now is the impact of listening in noisy situations, right? Like classrooms, like yeah. um, childcares, having assistive listening devices um, that children can, they're independent with those things and probably the social and emotional skills. I've got to say more than number concepts or literacy concepts. It's hard to get FaceTime with teachers. They've got, they've mm -hmm. got a really hard gig, I think, yeah. in terms of the number of kids they have in their classroom and everything they're trying to do. And they're fantastic in taking individual um, pieces on for children, but it's a class and you're one of 20 or 30, mm -hmm. right? Um, so helping parents advocate because they're going to be the best advocate. Alicia, I guess what I'm curious about from a professional perspective, you mentioned the Lochte study mm -hmm. that has come out recently that, that really talks about the importance of, of early intervention. What advice would you give to other professionals or centers who, who might be in a situation where um, they'd like to intervene early, but mm. th that isn't necessarily what's happening? I think that's the exact challenge because I I don't think it's, it's definitely not coming from the healthcare professionals, but obviously sometimes the governance and the situation where they are doesn't enable that. Um, I think what's helped us here do that in Australia has been really strong advocacy and really strong mm -hmm. um, collaborations across fields. So working not just as one individual clinic, but really getting groups together and having a powerful voice together. There is so much data and that is powerful for governments. And I think that the piece for us in terms of advocating for change mm -hmm. was really showing the long-term benefit of it because it might not win the next election cycle because it's not a short-term benefit yeah. but if you look at the long-term benefits of education of in of inclusion of society and participation and getting some of that long-term outcomes that we see now that's the part that absolutely and you do a cost-benefit analysis of that which exists yeah. now so it sounds sort of like objective evidence both from a clinical and an economic perspective yeah um, helps drive it forward, but you've got to just have the advocacy and just keep chugging away. Yeah, and find the people and have the ear and keep it going and keep that movement and getting advice on how to do that. What is the one biggest lesson that you've learned from your time in the hearing health community uh, that you'd like to, to share with, with our listeners? And it might start with you, Jen. Repetition is the key when it comes to kids to constantly be repeating, you know, your sounds that you're working on, um, talk all the time to your children, even if you're doing the dishes, do wash away and tell, no, mummy's washing, wash, wash, washing the dishes, I'm washing the forks, just, you know, talk to your kids about everything that you're doing, just so there is no silent gap. You want them to have as much input as they possibly can. And with that, they will start to speak sooner keep those cochlears on, the hearing aids, even if they're whistling and driving you mental, they're still getting that input. Alicia, how about you? What's what's your biggest lesson learned over your time in the hearing health community? Yeah, it's such a great question. And I think 
for me, it's learning to listen. It's actually, I have become a better listener as part of this because my job is to teach children to listen and to teach parents to teach their kids to listen. But in doing so, I think over the years, I've just learned to listen to them and listen to what's important and help them build a roadmap of how to get there. That's my job and that's how I can scaffold it. But I've got to be listening to them. Mm -hmm. I can't come in with any preconceived ideas or judgments, which I did as a new clinician. Mm -hmm. So it's taking that step back and being able to listen and really thinking about how it could be done differently. I think that, you know, there's so much for us as hearing health professionals that we haven't got to yet. Like we've done so much, I think, as a community globally, but there's so much exciting stuff to still to go that opens up to what we can do to help the lives of little people. Fantastic. Well, Jen and Alicia, it's been a real pleasure to speak to both of you today. I think it was so enlightening to hear the pediatric experience, both from a clinician's perspective and from that of a parent. So thank you again to both of you for joining us on the podcast today. Well, you're most welcome. And I am humbled to have been asked to share my journey with you guys and the world. So thank you. And thanks, Craig. Such a pleasure to have such a great conversation with you and Jen and yeah, chat about things that I love. And thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you press the subscribe button and give us a rating and a review. If there's a particular topic you'd like us to cover, please mention it in your review. We'd love to hear from you. You can find all the links to what was discussed in today's podcast in the description and stay tuned for our next episode. In the meantime, stay safe. Just a quick reminder, the views of the interviewees in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Cochlear Limited or its subsidiaries. This material is intended for health professionals. If you are a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Outcomes may vary, and your health professional will advise about the factors which could affect your outcome.